Evolution of life has progressed through survivors beating the odds to come out and pass their lives to their successors. Knowledge is a key for adaptation. We invite you to Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. This event will start on May 23rd with the neuropathology topic concentrating on new classification and recent advances. This meeting is a monthly based multi-speciality meeting that will discuss neuropathology, thoracic pathology, gynae and gastrointestinal pathology, breast, last but not least, dermatopathology. Seeking the truth has been daring and often led us into difficult choices to make. But solving the problem has created wonders, what people sometimes call as miracles. When our knowledge seeks the... This event will provide medical professionals with skills and knowledge and assist them in keeping up to date with this rapidly expanding area of medicine. Let's share each other what we have learned and what our actions can bring into the world, where our curiosity can bring the biggest of changes ever. I am eagerly anticipating an excellent meeting that will create a platform to share knowledge and experience with brilliant keynote speakers from different countries around the world. Take the advantage and be part of this unique event at Sheikh Shahboud Medical City in partnership with Mayo Clinic. See you soon at Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. Sometimes there is so much of what we do and often we forget about it and move on. But when the curtains drop and we go to sleep, let's remember that the knowledge we gain together has created miracles. Evolution of life has progressed through survivors beating the odds to come out and pass their lives to their successors. Knowledge is a key for adaptation. We invite you to Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. This event will start on May 23rd with the neuropathology topic concentrating on new classification and recent advances. This meeting is a monthly based multi-speciality meeting that will discuss neuropathology, thoracic pathology, gynae and gastrointestinal pathology, breast, last but not least, dermatopathology. Seeking the truth has been daring and often led us into difficult choices to make. But solving the problem has created wonders, what people sometimes call as miracles. When our knowledge seeks the hidden enemy, our eyes witnesses faces of happiness and hope. And that's why our eyes hold a special vision to see what's hidden between science and medicine. This event will provide medical professionals with skills and knowledge and assist them in keeping up to date with this rapidly expanding area of medicine. Let's share each other what we have learned and what our actions can bring into the world, where our curiosity can bring the biggest of changes ever. I am eagerly anticipating an excellent meeting that will create a platform to share knowledge and experience with brilliant keynote speakers from different countries around the world. Take the advantage and be part of this unique event at Sheikh Shahboud Medical City in partnership with Mayo Clinic. See you soon at Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. 
sometimes there is so much of what we do and often we forget about it and move on. But when the curtains drop and we go to sleep, let's remember that the knowledge we gain together has created miracles. Evolution of life has progressed through survivors beating the odds to come out and pass their lives to their successors. Knowledge is a key for adaptation. We invite you to Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. This event will start on May 23rd with the neuropathology topic concentrating on new classification and recent advances. This meeting is a monthly based multi-speciality meeting that will discuss neuropathology, thoracic pathology, gyne and gastrointestinal pathology, breast, last but not least, dermatopathology. Seeking the truth has been daring and often led us into difficult choices to make. But solving the problem has created wonders, what people sometimes call as miracles. When our knowledge seeks the hidden enemy, our eyes witnesses faces of happiness and hope. And that's why our eyes hold a special vision to see what's hidden between science and medicine. This event will provide medical professionals with skills and knowledge and assist them in keeping up to date with this rapidly expanding area of medicine. Let's share each other what we have learned and what our actions can bring into the world, where our curiosity can bring the biggest of changes ever. I am eagerly anticipating an excellent meeting that will create a platform to share knowledge and experience with brilliant keynote speakers from different countries around the world. Take the advantage and be part of this unique event at Sheikh Shahboot Medical City in partnership with Mayo Clinic. See you soon at Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. Sometimes there is so much of what we do and often we forget about it and move on. But when the curtains drop and we go to sleep, let's remember that the knowledge we gain together has created miracles. Evolution of life has progressed through survivors beating the odds to come out and pass their lives to their successors. Knowledge is a key for adaptation. We invite you to Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. This event will start on May 23rd with the neuropathology topic concentrating on new classification and recent advances. This meeting is a monthly based multi-speciality meeting that will discuss neuropathology, thoracic pathology, gyne and gastrointestinal pathology, breast, last but not least, dermatopathology. Seeking the truth has been daring and often led us into difficult choices to make. But solving the problem has created wonders, what people sometimes call as miracles. When our knowledge seeks the hidden enemy, our eyes witnesses faces of happiness and hope. And that's why our eyes hold a special vision to see what's hidden between science and medicine. This event will provide medical professionals with skills and knowledge and assist them in keeping up to date with this rapidly expanding area of medicine. Let's share each other what we have learned and what our actions can bring into the world, where our curiosity can bring the biggest of changes ever. I am eagerly anticipating an excellent meeting that will create a platform 
to share knowledge and experience with brilliant keynote speakers from different countries around the world. Take the advantage and be part of this unique event at Sheikh Shahboud Medical City in partnership with Mayo Clinic. See you soon at Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. Sometimes there is so much of what we do and often we forget about it and move on. But when the curtains drop and we go to sleep, let's remember that the knowledge we gain together has created miracles. Evolution of life has progressed through survivors beating the odds to come out and pass their lives to their successors. Knowledge is a key for adaptation. We invite you to Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. This event will start on May 23rd with the neuropathology topic concentrating on new classification and recent advances. This meeting is a monthly based multi-speciality meeting that will discuss neuropathology, thoracic pathology, gynae and gastrointestinal pathology, breast, last but not least, dermatopathology. Seeking the truth has been daring and often led us into difficult choices to make. But solving the problem has created wonders, what people sometimes call as miracles. When our knowledge seeks the hidden enemy, our eyes witnesses faces of happiness and hope. And that's why our eyes hold a special vision to see what's hidden between science and medicine. This event will provide medical professionals with skills and knowledge and assist them in keeping up to date with this rapidly expanding area of medicine. Let's share each other what we have learned and what our actions can bring into the world, where our curiosity can bring the big Hello, Dr. Gopalakrishnan. You are uh, muted, I think. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you are already. Yeah. You are you are a co-host. You can present, and you can do everything. You have full control over the meeting. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So I'll just. Uh, uh, we we officially like, yeah. started uh, at. Uh, um, in six minutes, in, Dr. Krishna. Yeah. In six minutes, uh, we start. So I'll just, I can share. Hi. Hi. I'll, I'll share uh, uh, my screen. Correct. Uh, just wait. Uh, for before you share your screen, uh, allow me to introduce you in six minutes, please. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just wait for more guests to join. Thank you. Evolution of life has progressed through survivors beating the odds to come out and pass their lives to their successors. Knowledge is a key for adaptation. We invite you to Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. 
This event will start on May 23rd with the neuropathology topic concentrating on new classification and recent advances. This meeting is a monthly based multi-speciality meeting that will discuss neuropathology, thoracic pathology, gyne and gastrointestinal pathology, breast, last but not least, dermatopathology. Seeking the truth has been daring and often led us into difficult choices to make. But solving the problem has created wonders, what people sometimes call as miracles. When our knowledge seeks the hidden enemy, our eyes witnesses faces of happiness and hope. And that's why our eyes hold a special vision to see what's hidden between science and medicine. This event will provide medical professionals with skills and knowledge and assist them in keeping up to date with this rapidly expanding area of medicine. Let's share each other what we have learned and what our actions can bring into the world, where our curiosity can bring the biggest of changes ever. I am eagerly anticipating an excellent meeting that will create a platform to share knowledge and experience with brilliant keynote speakers from different countries around the world. Take the advantage and be part of this unique event at Sheikh Shahboud Medical City in partnership with Mayo Clinic. See you soon at Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. Sometimes there is so much of what we do and often we forget about it and move on. But when the curtains drop and we go to sleep, let's remember that the knowledge we gain together has created miracles. Nishu, now you're there. Can you kindly mute yourself and close your video, please? Yeah. 
So uh, let's start. Uh, welcome you all to uh, Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. This is our third session. And um, I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Merli Krishna. He is a consultant in the Department of uh, Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic, uh, Jacksonville, uh, Florida, and the Associate Professor at uh, Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Sciences. Uh, he has been actively involved in practice education and research uh, at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville since 1999 with interest and uh, uh, research mostly in gastroenterology uh, and hepatology. Without any further ado, please let's welcome Dr. Krishna. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, and, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Gopal Krishnan too, uh, to both of you and the Department of Pathology at SSMC for hosting this um, excellent forum and um, inviting me to be part of that. And uh, I'm hoping that I'll be able to uh, uh, present uh, pathology or aspects of pathology that will be helpful. Um, so should I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, please. We are waiting for it. All right. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, we could see you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. Right now we are seeing. Uh, as a post attendee Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, PowerPoint is open. Yeah. Okay. So do you see my first slide? Yeah, it's a clear. Yeah, we can see that. Right here. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I uh, decided that uh, I was going to present two uh, topics, two cases. Uh, one, a GI uh, tract related uh, pathology case, uh, followed by a discussion of uh, differential diagnosis and also some uh, relevant literature. And uh, I also uh, will later present as a second uh, case, a, uh, a case of liver pathology um, with uh, some interesting aspects to it. So my first case is uh, focused on um, non-inflammatory uh, uh, bowel disease uh, type of colitis. And I decided to do this uh, because uh, uh, there are a number of different uh, things that come into the differential diagnosis. It's a very common aspect of our practice uh, for all of us. Um, and I thought that this would be a, a helpful uh, one to discuss. Uh, first of all, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. And uh, in terms of my goals of this uh, presentation, I will review, uh, present and review a case of non-IBD, non-inflammatory bowel disease colitis. I will review uh, some pathologic differential diagnoses uh, and discuss uh, these entities in relation to the case I present. And I will also uh, uh, briefly review some pertinent literature. So this is a, uh, a very interesting uh, case uh, and um, a very, uh, interesting patient who uh, had uh, a diagnosis of melanoma, primary melanoma of the thigh, patient is 69 year old male at presentation. Uh, at the time of diagnosis, um, the patient uh, was already having high stage disease. And I believe it was uh, with in involvement, metastatic involvement of the inguinal lymph nodes, uh, as well as uh, radiographically uh, convincing uh, metastatic nodules in the lung. 
so clinically a stage four disease. And he uh, came to, uh, so this uh, diagnosis was made apparently in 2020. And then uh, the patient presented at Mayo Clinic uh, in February of 2021 uh, for in consultation for further management. Um, and uh, the evaluation was done. Uh, and within the uh, next uh, few days or a week, uh, the patient was started on uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab, um, uh, which are checkpoint inhibitor uh, uh, type of drugs. And uh, as we all know, these are uh, widely used nowadays. Uh, and um, so the patient was uh, started on the treatment and about a month later, the patient presented uh, back at the uh, clinic with uh, uh, rash and pruritus. Um, and uh, subsequent to that, I think within a couple of weeks, patient also developed diarrhea, watery diarrhea. And that diarrhea became actually significant enough to cause dehydration. So it's a, it was a big a problem for the patient. Um, and uh, obviously the, the oncologists are very aware of uh, you know, potential side effects of the medications they give. And um, as part of the workup of the um, uh, diarrhea, the gastrointestinal problem, uh, the patient, uh, had a upper and a lower endoscopy uh, and biopsies were obtained for histology. Uh, so the, both, the upper endoscopy wasn't very striking. There were some abnormalities and the lower uh, endoscopy had some significant findings. Uh, so I won't show the upper endoscopic biopsies or pictures, but uh, I will focus more on the uh, biopsies from the colon when I discuss pathology. So he has a picture. I have a couple of pictures that uh, my clinical colleague uh, provided me of the endoscopy that was done at the time. So uh, as you can see here, um, the uh, I hope uh, everybody can see the pointer. So there is an arrow here. Uh, the, the mucosa is uh, sort of has a, a variegated appearance. In some areas, it's uh, uh, smooth. In some areas, it's irregular. And then you can see this uh, localized areas of uh, what appears whitish discoloration irregularities. And then there's a large patch here of uh, whitish sort of uh, surface uh, scab on it, and uh, possibly some areas of superficial ulceration here. So uh, not overly striking, but definitely uh, abnormal endoscopy. And I believe this is more uh, in the region of the proximal colon cecum. So cecum here, and I'm, I'm assuming this is the terminal ilium. Uh, it's just uh, difficult to put this together in terms of the normal anatomy, but that's how I think it looks. But again, the same thing, there is some ulceration or erosion, some, which is patchy, some exudates on the surface. Uh, so what looks like a uh, endoscopically uh, appear uh, colitis uh, appearing mucosal uh, uh, change here, abnormal, definitely. There are some uh, areas here that the folds are bigger, in which the folds are bigger, and uh, potentially some areas of punctate ulceration as well. So I think I have one more picture. Uh, I'm not sure how much of this is reflective light uh, from the material of the surface, but definitely uh, uh, still variegated appearance uh, from a different area of colon. Uh, congestion, possibly erosions, and a uh, few uh, areas where uh, uh, it just seems a little bit more red. So biopsies were taken, and I believe that the endoscopic uh, picture of uh, possible colitis or abnormal mucosa was fairly diffuse. Um, and here is a uh, picture of the histology. And as you can see, um, the uh, histology is fairly abnormal. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, under uh, low to medium, medium uh, magnification, the histology looks abnormal uh, in terms of the architecture. So you can see some crypts here that are remaining, and then there are large areas here that, that uh, do not have crypts. Uh, there's possibly an erosion here, uh, right there, and then there is edema, 
And also, uh, even at this magnification, you can see this uh, uh, neutrophilic micro uh, uh, cryptitis, cryptapsis. Um, and we take a look at it uh, a little bit more closely. Uh, again, uh, a different area. Uh, there uh, is inflammation, possibly some erosion. A little bit difficult to tell whether this is true erosion or the, the uh, surface has broken off or peeled off mechanically. Uh, the crypts are irregular, missing. Uh, one of the things we note is that some of the crypts appear atrophic here. Uh, and uh, they are fairly interspersed uh, in between some of the uh, re reactive, uh, regenerative looking crypts, dark staining. Uh, but again, you see neutrophils here, lymphocytes and plasma cells. Definitely abnormal uh, picture, a picture that at this point we can safely call uh, colitis. Um, higher magnification. One of the things that we have uh, obviously described the plasma cells and the lymphocytes, but then um, we also see uh, uh, apoptoses uh, within the crypts um, scattered. So I think I have another image of that. So it was easily identifiable. Um, again, some edema here. So I'm just showing a few more. In some areas, there the uh, histology was a little bit more quiescent. Uh, by that, uh, I mean, uh, first of all, the uh, inflammation in between the crypts was less, and uh, there does not seem to be any neutrophils here, maybe one or two here. So the active component of the uh, inflammatory process was uh, much less in this particular area. So a uh, variable appearance, uh, in histology, but a fairly diffuse process involving uh, the colon. Here's another one. This one actually shows apoptosis again uh, in the presence of a background that's uh, inflamed with lymphocytes and plasma cells. So in the context of uh, the clinical history, uh, the presence of abnormal looking mucosa specimen was submitted for microbiology, uh, as well as uh, blood uh, microbiologic study, blood culture was done. A stool uh, was also submitted for microbiology, including testing for C. difficile and culture uh, for possible infectious etiology. And those are all negative. Uh, and this particular testing uh, becomes a very important step in the evaluation of the colitis in this particular clinical setting. Patient uh, who has a stage four uh, malignancy being treated with uh, checkpoint inhibitor colitis, or actually even uh, you know uh, using other uh, types of uh, systemic therapeutic agents, but certainly a very important step here. And these these studies were negative. So what I'm trying to emphasize, as you can probably tell, is that every attempt was made to rule out an infectious etiology. So. The diagnosis uh, based on the aggregate of clinical history, uh, presentation, uh, and pathology uh, was that this is an active colitis and it is consistent with immune checkpoint inhibitor induced colitis. And I think we, we said that uh, in the context that uh, was clinically uh, pointing towards a checkpoint inhibitor related colitis and inflammatory process. So uh, I think I, I, the way I phrased it is that there is an active colitis in my report with a description. There is an active colitis and the fi overall findings are consistent with an uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor in use colitis. And I also uh, added a note that uh, uh, correlation with, uh, you know, uh, clinical uh, findings and microbiologic studies would be important. So uh, just to continue the history, what happened to the patient? Um, so diagnosed with colitis. And uh, I think um, uh, from the standpoint of pathology, uh, and uh, the studies that I just mentioned, uh, studies of microbiologic uh, investigations, including culture and testing for C. difficile, uh, 
it was concluded uh, on the basis of all things that uh, were available, all data that was available, that this is a uh, even clinically uh, consistent with a checkpoint inhibitor colitis. So pathology and the clinical impressions were um, um, in sync, um, so in agreement. So patient was started, uh, started on intravenous uh, steroid. Uh, patient wasn't doing well, and I think based on the abnormality or the extent of abnormality or degree of uh, uh, colitis that was seen endoscopically, they tried, uh, they, they were uh, trying to be aggressive, a little bit more aggressive than um, just uh, starting oral treatment. So they started intravenous steroids. And um, with that, the patient improved quite uh, remarkably within a few days. Um, and following that, uh, oral steroids were uh, started and they were tapered uh, over time. Um, the remarkable thing about this patient, obviously patient had this, uh, uh, you know, uh, more, more or less acute onset uh, problem related to the medication, which was managed with, with steroids. The patient, um, patient's melanoma, um, uh, was in complete remission um, uh, at the time of last checkup, which was 8 or August of 2022, so very recent. Um, the, I believe that the oncologists felt that the most likely culprit uh, was ipilimumab, which is the uh, CTLA-4 um, inhibitor, anti-CTLA-4 uh, uh, medication. And, and that was, I think, is known to be a bigger problem. So they stopped that. And uh, the patient was started on weekly nivolumab treatment and was continued in that. And on based, you know, on that treatment, the patient did fine with respect to diarrhea and also, uh, as I mentioned, had complete remission, remission of melanoma. So it's a pretty amazing story, the stage four melanoma um, you know, other than the patient's uh, uh, medication-related problem, acutely, the melanoma also was completely treated so far in remission. So a very uh, successful story of that mode of treatment. So brief review of literature uh, is an article uh, that many of you may be familiar with, uh, Chen et al. published in 2017. They studied um, eight patients, uh, who had pan colitis uh, and uh, on histology <clears throat> had active colitis uh, with uh, associated prominent apoptosis. And in, in, within the histology, one thing that was noticeable was the presence of atrophic uh, appearing crypts, which is what I described in this particular patient's uh, biopsies. And this particular picture, of active colitis with apoptosis and atrophic crypts was present in five of eight uh, patients, so more than 50%. The other pattern that was uh, highlighted in this particular study was the presence of lymphocytic colitis pattern in a minority of the patients. So they described two patterns, active colitis with some associated findings and lymphocytic colitis. And in that, study, in their study, uh, there was complete uh, uh, response to steroid therapy in seven patients and one patient had partial response. So uh, both uh, with respect to clinical um, impression and confirmation with pathology and putting all things together, diagnosis of um, you know, checkpoint inhibitor related colitis is uh, important. Um, and steroid therapy helps. <clears throat> this is another study which was uh, published in 2021 and more patients. <clears throat> and uh, 86 patients were studied um, with a diagnosis of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor colitis. Uh, and these patients had uh, were on multiple drugs. Um, and there were... Uh, more patterns listed in this particular study uh, than the one I mentioned previously. So uh, of the 86 patients, uh, 
22 were characterized as having histologically diffuse active colitis. 22 were uh, having uh, shown to have chronic active colitis. So you can see the difference between the first two diagnoses is sort of subtle. The, you know, what's the difference between diffuse active colitis and chronic active colitis? And I think that from the way the diagnosis are stated here, the patterns are stated here is that in the first one, they're not using the word chronic. And in second one, they are using the word chronic. So the difference was that there were aspects of histology that made them convinced that this particular process had been there for a long time. So uh, what it tells me is that in you know not all cases, you can actually label the patient as having a chronic active colitis. I think um, there was some uncertainty and, and that's something to note. They also uh, had lymphocytic colitis pattern uh, in 16, uh, collagenous colitis pattern in 14. So uh, um, in 30 of their cases, they had a pattern of microscopic colitis and a mixed pattern of colitis. And I'm not sure what exactly it is, but it probably had a mixture of uh, different patterns with some lymphocytosis, some you know diffuse active with architectural changes, et cetera. And then seven patients had a predominantly GVHD-like colitis in which, uh, obviously, as we know, the histology of GVHD, there is inflammation, but at the same time, uh, apoptosis is uh, actually a, a pretty important um, part of that process and actually uh, uh, becomes uh, very easily noticeable. So the emphasis on GVHD-like pattern based on the presence of apo apoptosis uh, becomes the primary uh, pattern that they described. Uh, to call it a GVHD-like colitis. So a, a bunch of different patterns here, as you can see. Um, you know, if you look at all the different patterns described, uh, one is fairly convinced that there is a, it's a mixed bag. Uh, so there is no pattern here that you can just look at and say, ha, oh, this is, uh, uh, you know, um, really indicative of checkpoint inhibitor colitis. There is some variability uh, quite a bit of variability in, in, the, in the inflammatory patterns that one sees. And uh, these patterns have to be really uh, put into context uh, with the clinical picture. Um, the right setting is, is very important. Um, some of the other things they mentioned is the ipilimumab uh, medication drug uh, was more likely to cause diffuse active colitis without chronicity, less likely lymphocytic colitis. So the reason why that's the, that's the more aggressive uh, medication, CTLA-4. So they, chronicity uh, develops when an, an uh, inflammatory process or a process of mucosal injury uh, is present for a while, maybe weeks, months, uh, enough for it to develop uh, uh, regenerative uh, changes and um, you know higher density of plasma cells. What it tells me is that the aggressiveness of the colitis uh, made it clinically present at an earlier stage. So that's my sort of conclusion with why uh, they're saying that they didn't really see evidence of chronicity in this. Uh, microscopic colitis uh, was seen more commonly in, with uh, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, which has the PDL uh, anti PD1 drugs, and uh, a pattern of chronic active colitis was seen more commonly with uh, nivolumab, which uh, as I uh, mentioned in the epilumumab uh, related uh, colitis, uh, uh, the intensity I'm assuming of the nivolumab, nivolumab related injury was uh, slow and progressive. Uh, it had enough time to uh, develop the typical architectural inflammatory changes, which is you know, plasma cell uh, rich. Uh, inflammatory infiltrate in the presence of architectural change to present more, you know, uh, 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 with a stronger association with a chronic active colitis. So here are uh, some other examples uh, uh, of uh, the patterns uh, observed, which 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 would be included in the list that is uh, uh, shown uh, with the second study. Um, 
the uh, I'm trying to uh, hide the screen on the top. I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, what do you What do you need, Doctor? Oh, the the uh, top panel here. I'm just trying to get the title of the slide. Is there a way to show the title? You don't. So want this to is an see that active chronic collision pattern. You see that? Yeah, I'm having some difficulty seeing that, but I think I'm fine. So this yeah. is a pattern of active uh, chronic colitis. Uh, that um, is characterized by, you know, uh, a large area, a large focus here of missing crypts. And uh, on either side of it, uh, there is a crypt with some architectural changes, minimal. Uh, and active inflammation. So the mucosa is very distorted in terms of architecture. Um, and here again is uh, another example. Uh, so these are uh, different examples, not from the same patient. Here's a, um, a case where there is a, uh, an active uh, chronic colitis um, and uh, there is the presence of this lymphocytes and, uh, and plasma cells and as well as neutrophils. Um, within the crypts, cryptitis. And um, this is a case of mild <clears throat> active colitis. Uh, you can see that it's patchy. Some areas have normal crypt architecture. There is a, an injured crypt here. Um, and then there are some other areas of inflammation with uh, neutrophilic uh, cryptitis here and crypt abscess, and, and then alternating with some other areas that look um, Relatively preserved. The histology is quite variable. Uh, that's the point that I wanted to emphasize. Uh, another um, biopsy that has uh, somewhat of a disturbed abnormal architecture, uh, some inflammatory change, certainly not normal, some edema. Uh, there is a crypt here that's uh, very distorted, and then probably some crypts that are missing. So, uh, and then here is one with lymphocytic colitis. We all have seen many examples of lymphocytic colitis, microscopic colitis, very obvious prominence of intraepithelial lymphocytosis. So that's not a problem. Uh, here is an example of collagenous colitis. That's one of the patterns described. Um, with a with thick band of collagen, subepithelial subsurface collagen here, and some uh, intra. <laughs> um, so, uh, there is presence of a thickened collagen band and with some intraepithelial lymphocytosis here. Here's another example, just to make it a little more uh, clear. Uh, this particular case does not have too much inflammation, but has a picture of uh, GVHD. So this is another case of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor colitis, which was really not very active. So, all, with all that said, I wanted to touch upon um, some differential diagnos diagnosis, diagnostic considerations, and sort of how to approach, how to handle these cases um, when uh, that's the question, or it's a sort of a more complex clinical scenario. How do you sort of dissect things out and how I generally handle these? Um, so, here is a uh, on the left is the histology that I have previously shown just uh, in, you know, a few minutes ago of uh, our case of checkpoint inhibitor-related uh, colitis. And here is a case of uh, acute colitis. So I'm just talking about patterns. Uh, when we have acute colitis with very little architectural distortion and the presence of mostly neutrophils, that is a, uh, a, a fairly broad differential um, uh, diagnostic consideration in terms of the etiology. So one can have 
um, an infection, uh, possibly a medication, um, and sometimes the cause is not known. Uh, so a self-limited type of uh, um, picture, but anything that causes mucosal injury um, and is caught early enough um, can have this picture. So while the cases that I have shown have more striking um, you know, uh, histologic alterations, just some uh, presence of neutrophils um, really does not entirely exclude uh, the fact that the patient could have checkpoint related, related uh, injury. So that's not really excluded. Important thing in this particular setting from the picture on the right of acute colitis would be to mention that uh, the pattern is mostly uh, that of an acute colitis um, and um, an infectious etiology <clears throat> should be a very strong consideration. And if that is excluded, then I think the um, consideration for a checkpoint inhib uh, inhibitor related colitis should be left in the, you know, uh, for consideration uh, in the hands of the clinical uh, colleagues. They may decide to stop the medication or uh, if the, you know, the, uh, the stool studies uh, in terms of identifying the microorganism and cultures are negative, uh, then they can uh, probably try uh, treating the patient with steroids. And I'm, the reason I'm saying this is that if it does turn out to be an infectious etiology, it's really not a specific picture in terms of, you know, what's causing this. And if it does turn out to be an infectious etiology, giving steroids would exacerbate that. So it's sort of a, uh, an important uh, uh, step to pause and, um, you know, uh, mention um, or raise the possibility of an infectious uh, etiology. Here's another example. Uh, this particular case uh, has um, on, the, on the left, the histology from the biopsy that I showed on the previous slide and previous to that, and a full-blown example of a salmonella uh, infection, salmonella colitis. As you can see, uh, one could, uh, appreciate so certain similarities between the two. Uh, obviously, on the right, salmonella colitis is an acute process. It's a pretty destructive uh, mucosal injury. On the left-hand side is checkpoint inhibitor related colitis. And one can um, see that there is a certain degree of histologic overlap. So again, the emphasis here is that uh, the interpretation should uh, be done in such a way that the clinicians are cautioned that such a histology could be possibly an, inf an infection and that should be excluded. Uh, imagine uh, this particular patient on the right being treated with steroids. On the left again is our case and on the right is IBD. Now, IBD generally uh, presents with uh, fairly uh, a convincing histology for a chronic crypt destructive colitis. And by that, I mean uh, a fairly uh, easily recognizable architectural disarray, regenerative branching and hyperchromasia. And in a, a background that is rich in plasma cells, particularly basal plasma cells um, and lymphocytes. Uh, oh. So, so uh, the histology looks different, but as I said earlier, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor colitis can present as uh, chronic active colitis or chronic inactive colitis, I guess, uh, in some cases, or minimally active chronic colitis, uh, which would resemble an in, uh, idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease. And the reason why uh, it does resemble the uh, picture of inflammatory bowel disease is because the injury has been given enough time to evolve into a chronic or longstanding uh, uh, um, type of injury where the mucosa has had a chance to recruit, uh, you know, or, or uh, develop the density of plasma cells that you normally see in IBD, as well as the regenerative healing architectural changes. So the presence of uh, a picture that is looking like IBD does not really exclude uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, I once had a case where the patient did have a history of IBD, 
and was also on checkpoint inhibitor. And it was difficult, but I think eventually I decided based on the overall findings that it's probably likely that the more acute problem is the immune checkpoint inhibitor, obviously helped by the clinical uh, presentation. On the right here, again, the same picture on the left, um, this is the uh, mycophenolate related colitis. And again, you see that's a concentration. Now, clinically, how often would a patient with a stage four disease who is uh, receive, you know, uh, receiving immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, type of drug would have uh, be on also on mycophenolate? I guess it's possible, uh, but this is to emphasize that that pattern can also be seen. Um, CVID, uh, uh, variable immunodeficiency. Uh, you can have a picture of chronic colitis, but possibly a low-grade, a long-term uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor type of injury could come in the differential diagnosis. But as we all know, in CVID, uh, if you look carefully, uh, we do not see uh, plasma cells, or plasma cells are very present, but very difficult to locate. Uh, so this is a clinical scenario that uh, actually could happen. Uh, some other considerations, uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, I, as far as I know, um, um, granulomatous inflammation has not been described in uh, with, with immune checkpoint inhibitor. And obviously, in the patients who who could potentially have uh, a, a immunosuppressed uh, constitution, could possibly have an infectious etiology. So that could would still be should be excluded infection, but. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Crohn's disease or something like sarcoidosis uh, also comes in the differential diagnosis. Here is an example that's interesting. So uh, diverticulosis, diverticular disease associated colitis um, has a picture that resembles uh, idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, obviously it has to be right location, left-sided, but potentially a patient uh, who has diverticular disease, which is very common, could also be on immune checkpoint inhibitor. So uh, this does become, um, could potentially become a problem. So the way I would handle this is, is the uh, correlation with endoscopic findings. Um, the patient with uh, diverticular disease associated colitis, colitis would have uh, inflammation and this sort of histology in the right um, area, uh, distally the sigmoid colon where, uh, you know, there's a, there's a high likelihood of uh, the presence of diverticulosis. So even if the endoscopy does not mention the presence of diverticulosis, I would raise that issue that, you know, there is a uh, chronic active colitis. Um, the differential diagnosis includes IBD. Uh, and um, uh, uh, this particular histology may also be seen with diverticular disease associated colitis. Uh, immune checkpoint is not, you know, ruled out but it seems unlikely given the segmental distribution. Um, I mean, obviously this particular entity uh, is an important differential diagnostic considerations when we're talking about segmental distal stricturing disease or inflammatory process. Uh, and the primary consideration in that would be Crohn's disease. But I think potentially uh, in the right setting, uh, this type of inflammatory process could come into the differential diagnosis of, you know, long-standing immune checkpoint inhibitor related injury. Uh, uh, but uh, another one, I think this may be one of the last slides. So the uh, uh, presence of this other kind of chronic colitis, uh, which is the uh, diversion colitis, where the, the histology is pretty, pretty typical. Lymphoid, reactive lymphoid hyperplasia in the right setting where the uh, colon fecal stream has been, has been diverted. Um, so uh, uh, one has to recognize this histology and um, not um, really um, have a low threshold of saying that this is a you know uh, uh, straightforward ICI immune checkpoint inhibitor related uh, injury. So in summary, um, these are the points that I would like to make. Immune checkpoint inhibitor related colitis can have various histologic patterns. So we have to be very careful. Um, generally, um, one has to, I think my suggestion would be to be descriptive and um, indicate that such and such pattern has been described with immune checkpoint inhibitor 
related injury and correlation with uh, uh, you know clinical picture uh, and also importantly microbiologic studies uh, they have to be done uh, to support uh, 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 that particular drug as an et etiology for the colitis. Um, so as I mentioned, as a second point here, as I, I've already mentioned, um, it's important to describe the pattern, but mention that uh, this is really not a very specific um, and uh, it has to be interpreted in the context of clinical presentation um, and as well as uh, studies to uh, exclude an infectious etiology. Um, and um, my uh, third and fourth points really uh, uh, are uh, repeating what I just said, that it has to be in the appropriate clinical setting. So with that, I'll stop. And um, I'm not sure if I should continue the next case, which is a liver uh, case uh, or wait uh, to uh, take any questions or comments. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Krishna. Um, I just wonder if we have any questions, please. You can write it in the chat. Uh, I think we can continue, and if there is any question, okay. we can uh, collect it all together at the end. Okay. Thank you. So I am going to proceed to the next case, which is a liver case. And um, I wanted to discuss this because uh, it um, does give me um, um, some uh, you know, difficulty in trying to sort this out at times. Uh, and it's an interesting um, problem because uh, the uh, fact that it's not very easy to diagnose on a small biopsy um, is an important uh, uh, thing to note with these entities. So my topic is uh, non-serotic portal hypertension um, and um, how to evaluate um, for uh, this entity uh, on liver specimens, liver biopsies, and uh, you know, um, explants, trans explanted livers. But it becomes important when uh, biopsy is done uh, to evaluate evaluate for this. So again, no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, and uh, my goals for this particular uh, presentation uh, of this case is uh, to present a case of non-serotic portal hypertension, uh, review of pathologic differential diagnosis and review uh, some literature. So uh, this patient that I'm presenting um, is a 41 year old male and um, has a pretty substantial, significant past history. So in 1985, the patient was pretty young. Uh, he was diagnosed with lymphoblastic lymphoma uh, for which in 2005, so I'm assuming the patient had um, progressive disease or recurrence, had a bone marrow transplant successfully also had graft versus host disease, which was managed successfully. So pretty amazing. Um, in 2014, so uh, long after that, uh, patient uh, presented with evidence, clinical evidence of portal hypertension, uh, varices, splenomegaly. Um, and uh, on imaging was found to have thrombosis of the portal vein and splenic veins. <clears throat> so fairly extensive thrombosis in the portal vein system. A liver biopsy was done at that time. And uh, I'm not gonna show that liver biopsy, uh, but it was fairly unremarkable. Uh, it was a small biopsy and we really didn't have any sort of um, positive or confirmatory diagnosis histologically for um, the cause of portal hypertension, but just the negative, the presence of a negative biopsy, which was negative for cirrhosis, um, put the patient in a category of non-cirrhotic portal hypertension. Uh, is there multiple entities that would be considered under this uh, particular topic? 
And uh, I'll try to, uh, uh, from, from this particular case, what I, after I describe this case and discuss it, I'm gonna discuss uh, some of the other things that um, are related in, and, um, and um, mention those uh, cases so that those could be considered, should be considered as we evaluate this biopsy. So the main, main question is how the goal is what to think of, how to approach when we have a case where the patient has clinical evidence of portal hypertension, but the biopsy doesn't look very striking or there's no cirrhosis. What do we do? Um, so moving forwards with the history, um, in 2017, while the patient was still being monitored, um, um, clinically followed with, with uh, this portal hypertension um, and uh, you know the findings of thrombosis, et cetera, absence of cirrhosis and carrying a diagnosis of non-cirrhotic portal hypertension, uh, the patient was being watched uh, and uh, uh, in the interim patient was diagnosed with a meningioma and that meningioma was resected. Um, and so, so far the patient, you know, has not had a problem with that. In 2019, patient came to a point where the patient needed liver transplantation. So that was done. And uh, the, you would think that the, the past history of lymphoblastic lymphoma, et cetera, and the meningioma would have made um, you know, the transplant evaluation concerned us to what would happen, but the lymphoblastic lymphoma was very remote and the patient was considered to be cured and the meningioma was really not an aggressive type and a patient was deemed to considered, you know, qualified to receive um, a liver transplant. So here's the histology. So a, a, a kind of a medium, low medium magnification histology of the liver. Um, and I'm not sure that I can point out too many details, but as you can see, there is no cirrhosis. So patient has portal hypertension, no cirrhosis. And uh, you can see these open spaces here. Um, I would think that this is probably a portal tract, sort of cut, sectioned in a somewhat of a longitudinal fashion. And then there is probably a central vein, a few small portal tracts. So at a, you know first glance, it doesn't look very disturbing. Um, here's a, um, one of the um, larger veins. I would think that this is probably on the side of the hepatic veins. Um, and uh, there is a small portal tract here. There is an open vein here. There are some other portal tracts here, if you can actually kind of appreciate that. I'm going to show some higher magnifications of these portal tracts as well. There is a duct, um, there is a vessel here. But if you get uh, closer, he, here is a tract. So here's an artery, here's a duct, but there is a structure here with a small lumen. And you can see that there is a linear array of smooth muscle cells right here. So this is an occluded vein, occluded portal vein. Um, in a portal tract of this size, one would uh, see a pretty sizable vein. And um, the uh, outline that I'm making with the arrow here is probably the size of the vein that we should have seen. Um, some other areas of the explant, um, here's a small portal tract. As you can see, there is no open vein here. There is an artery. And I'm not sure where the duct is, but there's no open vein. Here is another one. Uh, there is an artery here. There is an area here that is a little bit fibrotic. There are a few lymphocytes here, but there's no vein. Of course, there's a background of steatosis. So one has to be careful because uh, actually a large number of patients, a large significant proportion of the population would have fatty uh, liver to whatever extent, steatosis. So that's pretty common. So we wouldn't jump to the conclusion that, huh, this would be some kind of a fatty liver disease, unusual appearance, maybe um, some degree of fibrosis, but still that doesn't explain the presence of portal hypertension. There's something else that's causing it. So here's another portal tract, a little bit bigger, duct, artery is right there. And then you can see the outline of the portal veins that is actually um, 
apparent because there's a layer of smooth muscle here, right there. And then there is a, there are two lumens here, which uh, I'm not sure if they're tangentially sectioned to cause this, uh, there's a single vein that's tangentially sectioned to cause this two lumen, um, lumina, or um, basically it was occluded and got recanalized. But certainly the lumen of the portal vein is decreased significantly. Two other um, portal tracts, portal areas, artery, difficult to localize the vein right here. So a consistent pattern, most of the a majority of the uh, smaller portal tracts uh, or actually even intermediate sized portal tracts don't have a patent vein. Here is a good example, maybe some recanalization or, or residual lumen, but uh, uh, really um, large amount of fibrosis occluding the vein. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the patient on imaging was uh, found to have thrombosis of the portal, uh, extra hepatic, you know, prehepatic portal veins. And uh, um, this is the hilar vein, a section of that, and it shows a um, fairly organized thrombus. Uh, so in some cases, one could do some special stains, and I, I really don't do them. I rarely do them. Um, you can actually try to see, um, use a trichrome stain to kind of highlight the structures a little bit more, but it, it really um, um, shows uh, findings very similar to those that I mentioned on the HNE stains, uh, multiple HNE stains uh, that I just showed. Here's an elastic stain um, that sort of shows the elastic lamina here, and then the um, occluding fibroplasia here that is narrowing the lumen. But generally, I don't do these stains. Um, here is one that actually shows the um, smooth muscle right here, and then some other muscle cells, maybe myofibroblasts, but then the, luma, lumina, the lumen sorry, is very um, diminished. So the diagnosis was, to me, was straightforward, a case of hepatoporal sclerosis, and obviously the, the presence of portal vein thrombosis, two things. Um, so just, I'm gonna discuss more aspects of the case and some other um, you know, uh, entities, but uh, the same patient continuing um, with the um, clinical uh, findings in 2021, more recently, the patient was diagnosed with a pretty large squamous cell carcinoma of the scalp, nine centimeters in size, and positive lymph nodes, a metastatic involvement of the regional lymph nodes. So that's a pretty significant finding. Um, this particular squamous cell carcinoma so far has not recurred. Obviously, the patient would have to be monitored very closely for evidence of a recurrence, uh, both nodal and metastatic to distant sites. And uh, in 2021, uh, evaluation was done with respect to liver function. And other than the fact that the patient had um, a lot of steatosis, a lot of fat in the liver, the liver seemed to be functioning fine. So no um, um, real issues with the um, allograft, liver allograft, other than that there was severe steatosis. So just to uh, um, discuss this and, and try to dissect this topic a little bit further. So portal hypertension basically simply means elevated pressure in the portal uh, vein system. So very commonly, as we all know, in cirrhosis, there is, there is at some point down the road, there's gonna be portal hypertension. Uh, portal hypertension is basically a hemodynamic uh, um, uh, alteration that um, will result um, if cirrhosis is given enough time. Now you may have cirrhosis without portal hypertension, which, which is compensated cirrhosis, but cirrhosis will eventually, given in a timely, give rise to portal hypertension and related complications. So if you look at cirrhosis, we classify cirrhosis as based on the known, known cause, such as fatty liver disease, autoimmune hepatitis, hepatitis C, et cetera. And then there is cryptogenic. So a portion of 
a, a certain percentage of patients who have cirrhosis will not have identifiable cause, and we call that cryptogeny. So evaluation of the explanted liver sometimes helps and sometimes doesn't. Now, what we are talking about today is non-cirrhotic portal hypertension. And non-cirrhotic portal hypertension may have a cause, and I will show specific examples, or it may not have a cause. And in this particular setting, it's called idiopathic. So two different kind of terminologies for with cirrhosis, we use cryptogenic and in non-cirrhotic in, 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 uh, non portal hypertension, hypertension, we call idiopathic, use the term of idiopathic. And um, it gets a little complicated and I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, the terminologies historically have not been very clear. Um, uh, in fact, it's been quite mixed. Um, uh, in terms of the idiopathic um, non serotic portal hypertension, there are several entities that uh, one may see, and it's important to keep in mind. So the case that I just showed with uh, hepatoportal sclerosis would be an important consideration of um, um, something to consider in a case that is non serotic but the patient has portal hypertension. Nodular regenerative hyperplasia is another entity. It's a histologic entity, but these are two related and may be seen together. So um, in the literature, they are sort of considered together. Um, and, um, and I think the reason is because they may actually be found um, in many cases as happening, being present in the same, uh, uh, same case. Hepatoportal sclerosis with a background of nodular, nodular regenerative hypoplasia. SOS is sinusoidal obstruction syndrome that is also um, may give rise to portal hypertension, and I'll discuss that a little bit more uh, uh, in the next few minutes. So, idiopathic, as I mentioned um, previously, the pathogenic mechanisms are not uh, largely unknown, not really known. Um, so just a brief review, um, literature review, um, very mixed in terms of case reports and series because the, the terminologies and the entities um, are not very clearly defined and um, they're all basically uh, included in this umbrella terminology, phraseology of um, idiopathic non serotic portal hypertension. So generally speaking, Presentation is with splenomegaly, thrombocytopenia, very still bleed. Um, these are uh, the um, result of portal hypertension. Uh, there may be ascites, there may be hepatic encephalopathy, um, there may be portal vein thrombosis. So um, I, I would think that um, our case, in our case, the portal vein thrombosis may actually be a secondary process related to the uh, hepatoportal sclerosis. However, uh, the uh, portal vein thrombosis in literature has also been um, described as something that would be indicative of a, of a patient who has a propensity to uh, be uh, forming clots, hypercoagulable state, uh, which could uh, be uh, 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 a reason why the patient occludes the uh, hepatic veins within the liver also. So portal vein thrombosis um, can be secondary to uh, the non-serotic, uh, idiopathic non-serotic portal hypertension, but um, it is also um, thought that in some cases, uh, in, in patients who have a propensity to uh, have thrombosis, may have portal vein thrombosis as a primary or a company process that is seen in the extrahepatic portal veins, but the occlusive changes within the liver may be also as a result of um, thrombosis and fibrosis following thrombosis within the liver. So giving rise to the um, hepatoportal sclerosis. So a little bit confusing, but I'm hoping uh, that I was able to sort of um, make that point uh, um, so that um, we understand that portal vein thrombosis may be a primary or a secondary event. 
uh, more prevalent in Asia, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged advantaged populations. Uh, the media, median age at uh, you know diagnosis is uh, 40 years, and generally uh, with a male predominance. Um, I am uh, looking at the uh, Western literature more, um, so I think that um, the um, picture may be similar in the uh, other populations as well. But I'm not sure. Etiopathogenesis and underlying mechanisms causes, um, there um, is a list of things that can cause this. Uh, immunological, uh, variable, common variable immunodeficiency is often associated in, in many cases with uh, uh, non-serotic portal hypertension, more in the form of nodular regenerative uh, hyperplasia, connective tissue diseases, Crohn's disease, and in transplant patients who have undergone organ transplantation. Uh, infections, intestinal, intestinal infections um, give, giving rise to septic emboli uh, that uh, travel and lodge in the intrahepatic portal veins or actually even extrahepatic, but intrahepatic portal veins uh, with organization and occlusion of the veins within the liver. Uh, HIV, uh, mostly related to the treatment, the drugs, uh, medications, toxins, thiopurines, azothiopurine, uh, particularly as we all know, arsenicals, vitamin A, pro-thrombotic -thromb disorders, as I mentioned. So thrombophilias, um, marrow problems, myeloproliferative disorders, antiphospholipid syndromes. Um, and the mechanism is what I had explained uh, earlier the propensity to clot, to um, coagulate and occlude the portal veins within the liver, which over time undergo fibrosis and, and scarring and uh, luminal occlusion. Rare genetic disorders are associated. I won't go into that. Um, diagnostic criteria uh, for this particular entity, um, idiopathic non uh, serotic portal hypertension, absence of um, presence of unequivocal portal hypertension and absence of cirrhosis. Liver function tests generally are unremarkable, so there is not much help, but that may actually, a negative finding uh, uh, is often helpful um, in the right context. So a patient um, who does not have an underlying you know, cause, uh, does not have a history of fatty liver disease, et cetera, um, and uh, um, presents with portal hypertension in the right setting of receiving, you know, having a, some sort of an immune disorder or being treated um, with um, the medications, toxins, uh, toxin exposure, et cetera. So in the right setting, uh, presence of normal liver function tests can actually uh, sometimes help, but generally they are within the norm, within normal range or very minimally abnormal. Imaging, um, on imaging, there is evidence of portal hypertension. So one can see uh, splenomegaly, uh, collaterals, ascites. Um, one can also um, uh, have an idea of on whether the portal veins are occluded or not outside the liver. Uh, and uh, one can measure the hepatic venous pressure gradient. And generally, uh, this, uh, the pressure gradient is not very striking. Elastography um, can be done, um, and um, nodular regenerative hyperplasia, uh, generally on imaging, um, may um, give sort of some indication of cirrhosis. But elastography, which measures the measures the degree of fibrosis, may um, show a correspondingly low uh, value. But elastography. Uh, can is not a very um, uh, very specific. Uh, in many cases, um, uh, the findings do not really correlate with uh, final final um, histologic stage of the uh, liver tissue. So, elastography can be used. It's a, a you know a relatively easy test, but may or may not help. Liver biopsy uh, is generally very important part of the workup. So the presence of portal vein sclerosis, or also called obliterative portal venopathy. Um, 
nodular regenerative hypoplasia with or without, as I mentioned, they may exist together with or without obliterative venopathy or portal vein sclerosis. And in, um, in a uh, certain subset of uh, cases, uh, central vein occlusive changes or sinusoidal obstruction syndrome or what we call a picture of venous outflow impairment may be seen. That, that does have a distinct histology and um, um, it, it is striking, it's generally striking enough to lead one in that direction that there is a problem um, at the level of the central veins. But the important thing to keep in mind and the reason why I'm presenting this case is that if there is a patient who is, does not have cirrhosis, but has evidence of portal hypertension, um, whether the patient has um, portal vein thrombosis or not, extra hepatic large involving the large portal veins, it is very important to keep in mind these two entities, obliterative portal venopathy or hepatoportal sclerosis and nodular regenerative hypoplasia. So if, if the biopsy doesn't look very striking in terms of cirrhosis, uh, it is important to evaluate for these. Treatment approach, is, it's pretty generic, management of portal hypertension. Some cases go to liver transplant and uh, if necessary, management of the portal vein thrombosis. Prognosis of these patients is better than um, patients uh, who have portal hypertension, uh, comparable degrees of portal hypertension, um, patients who have cirrhosis do worse than patients who have uh, portal hypertension due to uh, non-cirrhotic setting, non-cirrhotic uh, portal hypertension. In, uh, um, in some patients, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, patient needs uh, ends up needing a liver transplantation. And after transplant, these patients uh, generally do better because they really don't, the fact that the patient does not have an underlying disease that could recur such as uh, hepatitis, uh, infectious hepatitis or uh, autoimmune hepatitis um, or some underlying um, well-established liver disease uh, that caused cirrhosis. So in a patient with non-cirrhotic portal hepatitis, generally the, the liver transplant um, is, is, has pretty good outcomes. So a little bit of, uh, little bit of a uh, gross and microscopic anatomy. I'm gonna move a little bit faster here. So here is the um, portal vein going into the liver and hepatic vein, that's how the blood flows. Um, and uh, portal vein thrombosis would involve this, possibly in the other tributaries. So occlus occlusion of the portal vein at a, a level outside the liver can cause portal hypertension. The important uh, thing here is to emphasize on the um, histology or the microanatomy, because that's what we see in the biopsy. So here's a portal tract. There's a portal vein uh, in hepatoportal sclerosis. This is the level at which the occlusion occurs. This is the hepatic artery. So, so um, um, a larger portion of the blood is brought in by the portal vein and a larger portion of the oxygen obviously is brought in by the hepatic artery. So this here is the um, intrahepatic um, structure or histology of the, of the uh, 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 important uh, component that uh, is involved in this particular entity, non serotic portal hypertension within the liver. Um, so as I mentioned, hepatoportal sclerosis involves the portal vein. The other entities, nodular regenerative hypoplasia is at this particular level, sinusoidal. This is pre-sinusoidal. So here is the um, um, level at which the nodular regenerative hypoplasia develops and compresses and compromises blood flow leading to portal hypertension. The sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, which is um, right here at the level of the sinusoids or the distal, um, uh, at the level of the central vein, 
or the terminal hepatic vein and the distal sinusoidal um, lumina here. That's where the uh, sinusoidal obstruction syndrome happens. Um, so that's the um, post sinusoidal area. So these all these areas are, uh, can be involved in the causation of the uh, non serotic portal hypertension. So this is a picture of nodular regenerative histology of nodular regenerative hyperplasia is very difficult on a biopsy. And in this particular case, I think we were just suggestive. You can see this vague nodularity, vague zonation, areas of apparent nodularity and apparent compression. Uh, so there's a typical histology uh, of nodular regenerative hyperplasia, not very uh, easy to um, be sure on a biopsy quite often. One can do a reticulin stain because the reticulin stain highlights the zones um, that are uh, regenerative nodules and uh, intervening compressed uh, linear profiles of the reticulin fibers that are compressed by adjacent uh, nodules. Here is an explant or a resection, I guess, a surgical specimen that uh, has nodular regenerative hyperplasia. Um, so uh, there uh, are regenerative nodules, and then in between there are zones of compression of the sinusoids. So uh, this particular uh, entity is easier to diagnose on a, a larger specimen, such as a wedge biopsy or, or an explant, than you know, on a, a core biopsy. Another example here, a regenerative nodule, Another one on this side, perhaps a small one, and then zones, linear, sort of curvilinear zones of compressed parenchyma or compressed sinusoid that is highlighted by the reticulin stain right here. So a nodule, regenerative nodule that's surrounded by uh, this compressed zone of reticulin uh, fibers. So reticulin stain is very important. And NRH, nodular regenerative hyperplasia, generally looks nodular. The Post sinusoidal entity, and I'm going to go through this quickly, is all, does also cause portal hypertension, but it is accompanied by this picture of sinusoidal dilatation. So that is a little bit easier to um, to assess. And the presence of sinusoidal dilatation uh, because of the distal obstruction of the central vein or the terminal hepatic venue, venule, um, the presence of sinusoidal dilatation really indicates where the problem is. So here's an example, the central vein is occluded by this edematous loose uh, matrix that is organizing uh, and um, that is a lesion that one looks for. Again, that particular occlusive problem is giving rise to this dilatation and hemorrhage uh, within the uh, surrounding uh, hepatic parenchyma. So examples of other examples of non, uh, other examples of non serotic portal hypertension, non serotic and non idiopathic. So, schistosomiasis is uh, a common uh, cause in certain populations, uh, Asia and South America. One has to be careful not to miss sinusoidal infiltrates that are, that are uh, occluding the sinusoidal blood flow. Here's an example of T cell lymphoma, a close up view. So it would be important to stain, uh, perhaps even do gene rearrangement. Another example of lymphoblastic uh, lymphoma, the leukemia that has a sinusoidal infiltrate that uh, can occlude the sinusoids and give rise to portal hypertension. Here is a case of amyloid that, yeah, as you can see, is completely occluding the sinusoid. Sickle cell anemia, sickle cell disease. So sickled cells are uh, occluding um, the sinusoids. Here is the example, an example of Gaucher's disease. Um, and this is very focal, but in you know more extensive disease, uh, certainly there can be uh, sinusoidal occlusion uh, giving rise to portal hypertension. I have seen at least one or two cases of uh, solid malignancies. And this is a case of renal cell carcinoma that was uh, involving the liver, but had actually uh, no discrete mass lesion, but very diffusely infiltrative. So one has to keep in mind, this obviously is not a problem because it will be obviously malignant. The ones that are a problem are um, uh, hematolymphoid disorders that can uh, potentially be missed. So in summary, a liver biopsy is an important test for evaluation of portal hypertension. 
absence of advanced fibrosis should prompt consideration for other etiologies. Uh, hepatoportal sclerosis and nodular regenerative hyperplasia are important considerations for non cirrhotic portal hypertension. Neoplastic, finally, neoplastic processes should be considered in the differential diagnosis. And I will stop here for any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Krishna, for this very informative lecture, very interesting cases. Um, I don't see any uh, questions right here, and we are actually running out of time. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we move to our next speaker, um, uh, Dr. Jiro Nimo Jr. Uh, um, Dr. Junior is a, a specialist in anatomical pathology, and he has a Master of Science and Health from Federal University of uh, Biawi, and uh, he, he served as a uh, professor of pathology at Federal University of um, uh, uh, Piawi. Uh, his interest in um, gastrointestinal pathology, breast and dermatopathology. I'm sure we uh, we will also enjoy the complex, interesting cases in GI. So, Dr. Junior, without any further delay. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I already see many virtual friends in this meeting, and yeah. I hope, to, yeah, I hope to be face to face with you one day. Uh, okay. uh, let me. I don't have a conflict of interest, and. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank you, Dr. Hyra, for the invitation. Uh, and now let's go all together for a quick tour uh, of interesting case in GI path. My goal today is a uh, present interesting case, uh, provide diagnostic and pitfall alert for you and discuss a differential diagnosis. Uh, the first case is just a, a very illustrative uh, one already known to many, but can Dr. be- uh, Dr. Raymond, uh, you are, we are seeing that all the slides, we have, can you present it? What? Uh, we, are uh, we, are, we are looking at all these slides together. So can you put in the present mode, please? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay? It's okay. We, are, we still see the whole slides together. The okay. whole presentation. When you are sharing, you are sharing with screen. Yeah, now it's good. Yeah. yeah. Yes, now we can see it clearly. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. So uh, the first case, uh, it's a very illustrative um, one, a red known for uh, too many, but can be uh, misinterpreted. Uh, it was a uh, uh, 18 uh, female with gas pole. I put uh, a phone because I received many calls uh, until I saw the kids. When the, the doctor is the patient and or their relative is, the, is usually challenging case. It was a hyperplastic polyp, but uh, there was uh, something else. Look at these small clusters in the lamina propria. In, 
In this magnification, we see uniformity of the cells. We don't see lumen here. Here is the tip. See that uh, cell proliferation uh, starts from the wall and projects to the lamina propria. It's a good tip for, for this di diagnosis. For those who uh, have seen a case, don't miss it. But some uh, might say, neuroendoc tumor, next case. Let's go to the immunohistochemistry. It was negative for synapto, azine, negative for chromogranin, and negative for CD56. So we can say it's not a neuroendoc tumor. This, uh, this cell proliferation was positive for uh, beta catin, CDX2, and negative for P63. The diagnosis was hyperplastic pot with modular metaplasia. Uh, you can, you, you, you may see uh, 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 people calling this chant microcasinoid, squamous, modern. Uh, it's associated with neoplastic and non neoplastic process. It's a meaningless chain that can be misinterpreted, as I told you. There are many descriptions of this lesion, like this one, uh, similar to ours. As you see here, see uh, uh, beta catin here. CDX2 and CD10 here in negative for P63. Here is an important pitfall. Alert. See this adenoma associated proliferation mimicking uh, an adenoma, mimicking an adeno invasive adenocarcinoma. If you see here, there is an ir irregular proliferation starting from the wall to the lamina proper, mimic it and evasion. It's important to pay attention for this. My second case, uh, it's a 22 years old male with a gastric tumor. Microscopically, there, was, there were uh, two lesions, as you see here, the largest had been solid cyst. Here, at the lowest magnification, uh, we have an important clue, an important tip for diagnosis. What do you see here? Here we see a multinodular tumor, coarse lobules, of tumor separated by bands of normal smooth muscle. It's an important clue for this diagnosis. It's important to, to think about this because this tumor has an indolent course. Predominantly, predominantly uh, the cell wall uh, is epithelioid, as you see here, and uniform cells. Here, uh, from this nodular area, we see isolated uh, atypical cells in focal area. This tumor was positive for CD117, for uh, CD34, negative two for desmin, X100, and uh, negative or better saying, a uh, loss of labin for this marker. What is this marker? Dog one? Yeah, ST8B, okay? Então, uh, does, uh, remember this diagnosis when you see that plexiform architecture 
with epithelioid cells. If the diagnosis is SGA deficiency, GIST. So uh, in facing with epithelioid mesenchymal tumors, you're thinking about GIST, we need to, to do uh, the, the GIST markers. And uh, if it's negative, you need to think about other possibilities as pecoma, neuroendoc tumor, and glomus tumors. But facing an epithelial tumors with this aspect, we need to think about SG8 uh, deficient gastrointestinal tumor. These tumors account for a uh, five to seven point five percent of all of adult stomach GIST, and most of these tumors occur in childhood. This group encompasses uh, most periodic GIST and two syndromes, and these tumors have a unique clinic and pathological features, exclusively gas location, absence of case of PDGF-RA mutation, and this uh, architecture, multinodular or plexiform aspect, as you, we see, and epithelial morphology. So, uh, there are other tumors with SGA deficiency, as paraganglioma, renal carcinoma, and pituitary adenoma. It's important to, to remember that conventional risk and stratification fails to predict the progression of SG8 deficiency gastrointestinal tumors. And it's important to make this diagnosis because uh, these tumors run in relative indolent pus despite their frequent lymph node and distance uh, metastasis. Here, two bonus about GIST. The first case is a liver nodule with a mixed cell proliferation. We see epithelioid cell here and spindle cell here in mixed area. Now, see how interesting uh, in addition to being positive for GIST markers, these tumors uh, was also positive for pancytokeratin. You need to be careful with this uh, in, sample, in small sample. The tip is the gastrointestinal stroma tumor is invariable negative for high molecular weight cytokeratina, cytokeratina 7, 20, and 8. Facing a, a mesenchymal tumor, positive, uh, frente a, 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 a tumor like this, positive for cytokeratina, pan-cytokeratina, you need to add other cytokeratina in your panel. And it's important to remember that uh, when you are evaluating so, grass intestinal tumor, tumor that uh, all these tumors can be positive for CD 117. For example, melanoma. This is an uh, interesting case uh, because the cells are being twin normal glands. In this ulcerated area, you see a spindle and epithelioid cell. Here, similar uh, 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 signal ring cell. And you think you, you can think about a uh, Madeno carcinoma, for example. More detail, epithelioid and a spin cell. A spin cell is a red flag here. It's a gastrointestinal stomach tumor mimicking uh, an adenocarcinoma. The role of uh, pathologists 
when diagnosed uh, the GIST is established a diagnosis, it's important to consider morphological mimics. And for this, you need to use uh, immune stochemistry. Evaluate merges uh, in complete resections in place and a special consideration of resection or adjuvant therapy. Access prognosis features, molecular studies, and you need to consider syndrome etiology. If you see young patients, multiple GIST, family history, a lymph node metastasis, a history of other tumors, neurofibromatosis, and S G eight mutation. It's important to be to be to recognize a morphological and immune stochemic aberrance in post-treatment uh, tumors. Now, let's go get out uh, of the stomach and let's go to the pancreas. It was a 35 years old female with pancreatic tumor. Um, a tumor of nine centimeters and the head body of the pancreas. I think that I read in this magnification, you will suggest the diagnosis. It seems to have a papillae. Do you agree? Yes. Yes. So it's the papillary tumor. Yes. He is the uh, 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 classic feature. We need, we see a very clear papillary core with uniform cells. More detail. And here, yelling globules. I think it's okay. We have uh, features for classic salt bisopapillary plasma of the pancreas. I think everything agree with me. Agree with me. Including the age and the sex. Yes. Yeah. But there is a surprise. 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 So, okay. Uh, so, uh, salt bisopapillary so plasma of the pancreas, it's a low ma a malignant potential tumor with uh, five to 20 hectare or metastasis to distance organ occurred predominantly in young women, tail region or body. Most of cases uh, are incidental discovered on image and we can see this tumor in other sites extra pancreatic tumors as ovary and test, for example. Here, just recall the classic morphologic features, variable admissory of southern pseudopapillar areas, uniform cells with grooves, with yalin globules, with foam histiocytes. But, there was something else that made the case interesting. Here, side by side, good and evil. Uh, it's really bad, I don't know, but let's see, let's see. 8% of the tumor is this right here. Pleomorphic cells. But, See that papillae core and foamy isocytes are still here. Papillae cores and isocytes are still here in the pleomorphic area. And we can see grooves to get the pleomorphic cells. Two square infiltrative edge as we see here, and perineural invasion. The 
the feature that bring peace for the case is no mitosis uh, was uh, there wasn't my mitosis after exhaustive searching. Immune stocking is the one we already know about the uh, SPF. Beracatin, positive vimentin, loss of uh, E-cadherin, and negative for urine dot markers. The diagnosed is pleomorphic pseudopapillar, pseudopapillar neoplasm. The important clues here is out of the pleomorph cell, we don't see mitosis. It's a, the, the, the main differential diagnosis, high, high, transform, high malignant transformation of SPN. But in this case, we have a lot of mitosis uh, to get the pleomorphism. This, is, uh, this can be very challenging. We have these three sample. I, 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 I don't want to, to, to find these cells in this situation. Here, an interesting article about this, this variant of SPN. And in this article, they, the authors compare a conventional and pleomorph tumor. And see that many pleomorph tumors uh, show infiltrative margin, 13, extension behind the pancreas, 11, perineural invasion, 13, but all tumors have a low mitotic index. These patients has uh, some feature that related to aggressive clinical curves. Pleomorph nuclear pleomorphism, a large uh, size, and a perineural invasion. Case four, it's a challenge case. It was a male, six, five years old, with infiltrative tumor in the gas body. At low magnification, we see nodules in the lamina propria. Other nodule in the lamina propria. And this nodule had a full form cells with atypia, but quite monotonous. In more detail, we see epithelioids and a spindle cell, but monotonous. Atypical, but yeah, atypical. And when you are facing this case, we need to think about many, many, many possibilities. Yeah. You can think about uh, GIST, solitary fibrous tumors, neural tumor, uh, metastasis. And I, uh, in, in, case, in case like this, uh, we have to uh, eliminate possibilities. Yeah? I followed uh, this path until I reached this marker. Let's see. I saw a uh, diffusely positive for this marker. Where is this marker? It was positive, a uh, focal positivity for EMA, EMA uh, negative for pan cytokeratin, CD34, STAT6, 
Chromo, Synapto, X100, Desmin, SME, in CD170. This marker is TLE1. This patient uh, in PET scan is uh, only uptake in the stomach and no previ previous uh, history of neoplasm. This diagnosis was confirmed uh, by molecular test and in the fish uh, we detected the translocation. So sarcoma. it's a sarcoma. sarcoma. Yeah, so it's a primary gas synovial sarcoma. It's very rare with less than 40 cases in the English literature. Uh, other sites include esophagus, duodenum, small bowel and colon, mesentery, and omental liver, for example. It's important uh, immune stocking to, to, to read the diagnosis, and it's, it's necessary to confirm uh, with uh, a molecular test. The main treatment uh, is surgical. It's a, a, a difficult case, yeah? it's very hard, but when you're thinking about mesenchymal tumor in the stomach and exclude the principal possibility, you need to, to think about a more hair diagnosis. This other case, uh, the next case is a uh, a uh, male, 70 years old, with ulcerated gas lesion. Here we area of gastrites adjacent, uh, adjacent uh, to the tumor. And here the neoplasm. Uh, a somewhat organoid appearance with atypical cells having vesicular nuclei with prominent nucleoli. This cellular arrangement seemed to me something unusual. And the information, the clinical information was ulcerated uh, gas collision. So I decided to, to, to ask for information. Uh, uh, I would like to, to give you a tip. Uh, friends, from the telephone, from your mobile, can come your best tip. You need to use it. And the answer was, Yes, the patient has a leg mass and bone leak. So I add in my panel uh, several markers from different sites. And for my surprise, this case have, uh, was positive for CK7 and TTF1. It was a metastasis from lung adenocarcinoma. Any tumor came at, uh, 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 can go to the stomach. Yeah? The most frequently, we will see lobular breast cancer, renal carcinoma, melanoma, and hepatobiliar carcinoma. About lobular breast cancer, watch out for diff diffuse gas cancer in your organ. It's important to pay attention, and if you if you if you can add uh, some marker, it's important to rule out uh, the breast metastasis. And remember, melanoma can label with uh, CD one hundred seventy. It's important, especially when you are evaluate an epithelial GIST. It was an interesting case in my routine. 
uh, gas bi biopsy. And the clinical information was hypertrophic of gas fold with friability. Uh, and the principal diagnosis was um, uh, poor cohesive uh, gas gas norm. Here, there is a tip. A superficial lamina prop involvement with uniform epithelial cell, it's a red flag for the possibility of a uh, metastatic uh, origin. In this case, the, the, the cell proliferation was positive for CK7, estrogen receptor, GATA3, and monoglobin. So the final diagnosis in gas metastasis from breast lobular carcinoma. About breast lobular carcinoma, uh, you need to think about this possibility when you see uniform epithelial cell uh, in the superficial lamina uh, with a single file pattern. Uh, remember that positive for GATA3 and estrogen receptor uh, is useful for uh, confirmed diagnosis, but can be positive in low grade during dormant tumor. Uh, so you need to add other urine dot markers uh, in your panel. And in, uh, in the absence of expression of these markers, uh, it's crucial uh, close clinical radiological relation. My last case, uh, it's a male, 40 years old, and the, the clinical information was rectal exophic collision. We see a uh, rectal mucosa with a uh, erosion and normal glands. And between normal glands, we see um, a spindle cell proliferation. Spindle cell proliferation with red blood cell extravasation, as you see here. Uniform spindle cell with a uh, mild atypia. And we see some uh, vessel channels. And this uh, spindle cell. Kaposi. Yeah, great. In more detail, I, I, I didn't have other information, so I asked more information and this patient was uh, HIV positive. So I, I included my panel 88V8, it was positive. So it's an interesting case of Kaposi's sarcoma. And Kaposi's sarcoma can mimic granular tissue, vascular angiomatosis, and malignant neoplasm such as angiosarcoma, spinal cell melanoma, gastrointestinal tumor. Right? This is the, the principal differential diagnosis when you are facing uh, Kaposi's sarcoma. It was very rare before the uh, AIDS epidemic. The uh, capo sarcoma in gastrointestinal tract can precede, be synchronic, or develop without skin lesions. Typically, asymptomatic patients and due to tumor growth, uh, primarily in submucosa, bio biopsy diagnosis is possible in less than 25%. It's important to pay attention because this case can be very, very, very. Uh, Saro, uh, and its plasma cell component may not be valid uh, because it's a, a fragrant cell in the gas anti inflammatory condition. In my last bonus, uh, recently case that I that I have that I had, 
é, já tem meio, é, 35 years old, old age, e be positive with diarrhea, é, being treated of Kalazar, visceral Lichman use. Just uh, one peak, it's very nice peak, and when you see a combo of infection, huh? you see CMV, classic CMV, but uh, the interesting Lichman initial sites, as you see here. So uh, this patient had uh, CMV and uh, dissemination of Leishmania to gastrointestinal tract. I ended this quick tour and uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Is that me? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I need this picture. I really like it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Uh, um, you you really presented really challenging cases that we can come across it in the day life. Um, I don't know if we have any question, Ram. Do we have any question? Everybody can. Everybody can chat with them. Window. Yeah. If you I have any questions, you can write it down. Yeah. And also, I'm happy to see all the other friends here joining us in this group, indeed. Yes. I saw yeah. friends. Friends. And I, I, yeah. I hope to, I hope to, to be face to face with you. Yes, hopefully you can join us or uh, here in Abu Dhabi to visit us and to see this part of the world. We will invite you definitely one day. It will be a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Junior. Uh, it's, a, it's really an honor and a pleasure to have you. It was really a fruitful uh, talk and see you next time. See you. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Dr. Rabia, will you do the closing? Yeah. So I would like to thank all the participants, uh, all the audience. Uh, for joining us today and uh, see you next month uh, for the Breast uh, Journal Club. Uh, also, hopefully it will be an amazing uh, meeting just like this one. Thank you all and have a great day and good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ram. Bye. Uh, thank you so much. Another successful meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ram.